Hello and welcome to Greatest Somerville. I'm Joe Lynch. On our first show of 2019, it is my pleasure to welcome Byron DeLear, author of the book, The First American Flag, Revisiting the Grand Union at Prospect Hill. In addition to authoring several articles on the subject, Byron is an enviro entrepreneur, media producer, and former candidate for the United States House of Representatives. His work and interviews have appeared on multiple media outlets, including NBC News, the Christian Science Monitor, and the Los Angeles Times. Fresh off his speaking engagement at the Somerville flag raising on Prospect Hill here in Somerville on New Year's Day, Byron is here to speak about his book and some of his work with the Vexillological Association. He and his family make their home in St. Louis, Missouri. It is my pleasure to welcome to Greater Somerville and the Somerville Media Center, Byron DeLear. Byron, did I say it right? You gotta help me here, my friend. Vexillological. Yes, you know, you said it correctly. Okay. Uh, vex vexillological or, or vexology. Vexology, which you is, take it away. Yeah, sure. Right. Vexology happens to be the study of flags. Right. And um, it delves into the social sciences and symbols and language and semiotics. Um, flags over the years have been, been used to uh, congeal national identity and solidify a sense of belonging. Um, of course, flags have been used in warfare uh, often to denote one side or the other. And in the case of uh, naval warfare, of course, the concept of a flagship is critical because that's the ship that sends the signals to the rest of the fleet and tells the rest of the feet, fleet the maneuvers that it must in, engage in when, when in battle. Sure. And so uh, obviously uh, you would have an admiral on the flagship uh, because that would be the ship that would be sending out those signals. So in Somerville, you have this amazing history. You're right here in the shadow of it. Oh, I mean, it's, it's like my home away from home because I've, I've uh, come here uh, for this event on New Year's uh, five times over the last eight years. The first time I came in 2011, I serendipitously met the founder of Exilology, Whitney Smith, who okay. was here to attend the event. Yep. Yeah. And um, of course, many of your citizens will recognize that the first American flag was raised here over the new establishment of the Continental Army by General Washington uh, during the Siege of Boston on New Year's Day, 1776. But from a historian's perspective, and, and I'm a, a student of history, an amateur historian, um, what's fascinating is that we don't have any primary source record of what the design or the purpose of the design for this flag how was. How they came up with and it. How they came up with right. it. You know, why did it have a British Union Jack right. and 13 red and white stripes? There's a lot of mythology associated with the telling of the American Foundation. Um, but as a historian, you want to kind of wade through the mythology and get to the, get to the true elements and what is provable and what evidence that we actually have. And uh, one of the th comments that I mentioned in my presentation uh, on the New Year's Day event on, at Prospect Hill was oftentimes modern historians have to debunk inaccuracies and myth. Um, but there's been a tendency in the spirit of professionalism, perhaps, to kind of um, tamp down our appreciation of the founders and uh, tamp down any sense of patriotic fervor but what I offered the crowd there was, you know, we don't have to uh, subscribe to some sort of patriotic mythology mm. to be very um, impressed and revel in the fact that great things happened to bring about the United States of America. Even absurdly miraculous events happened to bring about the nation that we enjoy today. And um, so the, the critical month period of time leading into the Prospect Hill flag raising day, New Year's Day, from December 3rd to January 2nd, 1775 to 1776, yep. we see critical elements of the birth of our nation uh, materialize. And this is... Washington's in Boston. Well, Washington's in Boston, yep. but uh, we see a new Navy, inaugurated on December 3rd in Philadelphia 
and the Grand Union flag makes its debut on the Continental Navy's flagship Alfred on December 3rd, raised by Lieutenant John Paul Jones. Then we see a new army established, mm -hmm. a new flag established, and the very next day after Prospect Hill, we see the words United States of America and that is, written for the first that time. That is in your book. Yes, Pictures it is. of that are in your book. That, that happened to be a discovery that I stumbled across during my research. Um, an Irish immigrant named Stephen Moylan Esquire, who was, who was acting as aide-de-camp to Washington, writes United States of America the first day, um, uh, or this, uh, this, the day after the day Prospect after. Hill. And he's, he's writing this in Longfellow House, uh, which is the Washington's headquarters in Cambridge. And he's writing Joseph Reed in Philadelphia. And he's lamenting at why Congress hasn't declared independence yet. He's saying, why hasn't Congress declared that which our most gracious majesty insists that they have already done? Right. And then he says, I would vastly like to take the powers of the United States of America back to Europe so that I can procure war material for our effort. Um, and then, of course, seven months later, Congress did declare independence. And uh, it's just a fascinating thing. You're familiar thing. with government. Yes. That's why it took him so long, Byron. Oh, yes, I mean. of course. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's often confused because we were talk talking before the show. Um, the Grand Union flag was also referred to as the Cambridge flag. And primarily, you know, most of the folks who are native to Somerville know that we were part of Boston yes. at the time. And that Charles River, the Charles River divided our part of Boston from Cambridge. But because Washington's headquarters was in Cambridge, they often referred to it as the Cambridge flag. Here in Somerville, mm -mm, we would have none of that. Yeah. Once we established ourselves as a separate entity from Boston, we grabbed a hold of the Grad Union and said, that's ours. Yes, and you know, Lawrence uh, Wilworth from the uh, Ancient Artillery Company, I know Lawrence, yes, yeah. uh, um, he mentions this in some of his comments. The original term was Great Union that was that emerged, um, and then that eventually morphed in the 1800s by some historian to becoming Grand Union. Um, but, and this, this kind of goes to the heart of one of the controversies surrounding the uh, Prospect Hill flag raising, which, a, uh, which there's been a recent interpretation because the three primary source records that we have that describe the event use the term Union flag. Mm -hmm. And there was a vexillologist that looked at the word Union flag and just assumed, well, that must mean the British English king's colors, mm -hmm. just a, whole, a flag wholly English in design. So Washington perhaps didn't even raise any striped flag at, at Prospect Hill. And this is what really precipitated uh, the uh, depth of my research to look at the surrounding primary source record, to look at the events leading up to the Prospect Hill fra mm -hmm. flag raising. Um, aspects about General Washington and his attention to issues of formality and ritual sure. and discipline. Yep. And the, you know, um, Suffolk University professor Robert Ellison, who, Bob Ellison, who happened to attend the event this year, he mentions that it would be unthinkable for Washington in the context of establishing this new army uh, to raise the enemy's colors. Um, although there had been some evidence months earlier in an ad hoc context for colonists to fly British Union flags with words emblazoned on them mm -hmm. like liberty. Mm -hmm. um, but after Washington came to Boston following Bunker Hill, he worked tirelessly to build out the first army which would be nationalized an army entirely continental in nature is how Washington describes it in his New Year's Day's orders that, that he, he delivered that day. It was entirely continental in nature, meaning it was, a, it was an American army. And so naturally you, would, you wouldn't want to have a flag that was the same flag as the people you were fighting. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've, I think I've sufficiently dispatched um, the revisionist history uh, that but came we also, out, just you know, uh, attempting to um, update the Prospect Hill narrative that uh, just a simple British Union Jack was flown, which it's not the but case. But Byron, do you think that there was something in Washington's mind? Because remember, they were all British subjects. 
At that time, January 1st, 1776, they are still British subjects. Do you think there was something in his mind that said, so they don't come down on us like a ton of bricks? We're going to use that Union Jack, but we're going to also weave in the fact that we are 13 distinct colonies and we're going to join forces so here. It, you, you make me flash on three things. One is, uh, we, we know that Washington, as by November of 75, knew that all-out war was, was, ine was inevitable. Yep. So, you know, there was no accommodation that was going to take place, in his mind, as the commander-in-chief. Um, secondly, you could be right that incorporating a flag that had British and American elements uh, could be construed as sort of a hedged bet. Mm -hmm. Um, but we do know that it was described by both the Americans and the British as what they call the American flag. Mm -hmm. Now, if it had been a flag wholly unique in design, then definitely charges of treason would be that much easier to solidify right. Right. because as, as the king accused the Americans of in his proclamation to parliament in October of 75, he said the, these uh, treasonous rebels have designs for a, quote, independent empire, unquote. Mm -hmm. This is what he was accusing them right. of. And if, of course, they were promiscuously flying a, a unique flag that was completely different, um, then that, that charge would have been a lock, so to speak. Um, and then the third item is that one of the abiding mysteries of the Grand Union flag is that this exact design, a British Union Jack with red and white stripes, happened to be the corporate colors of the British East India Company right. for over a hundred years prior to its adoption as our first official, as our first national flag. And I go into the history and business connections of several of the founders, including Benjamin Franklin and Robert Morris, and their connections with East India Company principals like Sir Francis Baring, who became the chairman of the East India Company, and, and Thomas Walpole. Um, and uh, so we're going to be Byron. Excuse me for one second. Sure. We are going to be flashing up some of the pictures that you you described to me. But if we can, okay, I don't think we're going to be able to snap it that way. Yeah, that's from a wood carving. But it's a full uh, color. Yes. When you just start describing the origins of some of these insignias and the flags and the heralds and. It's a great color pictorial, yes, too. Yes, thank you. And it's available on Amazon and eBay if you want to buy a copy. And I'm, I'm selling signed copies at this point. I mean, history is, is definitely a labor of love. Is There's our, not a lot of units flying off the shelf. Well, speak, I mean, the, you <laughs> so know, I have authors, time to sign them all. <laughs> the authors come here and they pump their wares. Are you going to be selling these at the uh, museum? Yes, I'm giving a talk tonight at 7 p.m. Great. Um, at You're going to leave some movie. behind? for, for I, I'll, sale I'll at I'll the leave museum. You, I'll leave, yes, absolutely. Yeah, those absolutely. would be terrific. Absolutely. Sorry, go ahead. W one of the things that we touched on earlier, and I always have to say this because um, one of the old public schools that was torn down probably in the 60s, my dad was a great history buff as well. And I described this to you, what was in those public schools, every public school in Somerville had this uh, maybe two foot by one foot framed document that had you know this beautiful graphic on it the history of the united states of america flag mm -hmm. the stars and stripes the history of the stars and stripes and it this was published in 1898 mm -hmm. so as far back as 1898 i think people were making stuff up about it but they describe that there was always the suspicion that the stars came from george washington's coat of arms his sure. family coat of arms sure. and if you i there's a picture of it from the, the house. Lawrence Washington was the father? Yes. There's a picture of the coat of arms, and clearly you see the stars, yeah, there's and you even, see there's the stripes. Even, I, I've even seen an a impression of the coat of arms in England from the Washington family. Yes, that had and this, it's, the, it's in... Two, bar, two red bars and two, two exactly. uh, five-pointed stars. It's cast right above the door, the yeah. entrance to their house. And fascinating, in 1898, they had already made the link between the Washington family and the Spencer family. Mm -hmm. Princess Diana's family mm -hmm. and the Washingtons were related. So, I'm, I'm sorry, I went off course No, no, there, no that's fine. And, and there was quite a lot of uh, storytelling intertwined with history writing um, in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
In other words, the lines of demarcation were not so easily defined between telling stories, kind of like, you know, if you can imagine the oral tradition going back right. thousands of years, right. when, you were, when, when there wasn't really a demarcation between academic history and entertainment. They, they were the same thing, right? You were telling stories. There was no fact and, checking. And we, either. And we, and we live, <laughs> we, as, as creatures, you know, we love stories. We live and breathe stories and narrative, and this is how we survive. And this is how we uh, keep the tribe, so to speak, uh, cohered and, 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 and advance cohesion. Um, but uh, there, there could be a, a connection with the, the five pointed pentagrams and the, the two red bars of, the, of Washington's coat of arms. One of the things that I explore in the book is the connection to the Hanseatic League and the red and white stripes being the convention of the merchant's colors. And it's a fascinating historical nugget, the Hanseatic League. And I didn't realize the connection, when we were talking before we started taping, the connection that you made to Benjamin Franklin and some of the other merchant class sure. folks that were in London would have seen that yes. and would have understood that that was kind of a confederation of powerful business yes. concerns. Yeah, and you see, you see a kind of a migration away from royal control towards right. now instead of kings being kings, now business is king. And well, actually Franklin in one letter writes that the merchant people and mercantile class, so to speak, are very much in support of the American cause. Um, several of the principals in the East India Company are on record in describing uh, the king's policies as being completely tone deaf. And so you see this, um, you know, perhaps a, an understanding that that creating a nation that not only had ideological freedoms, freedom of speech, thoughts, action, religion, had value, but also creating a free market that was free from royal control. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a new thing. And so the United States as an innovation on the world stage essentially stands on two pillars, these ideological freedoms that we all very uh, are aware of, but also the free market reforms and the idea that the king could not have a piece of the action and every transaction would be subject to the capricious whims of the crown. That this was, this was something that we did not want to have in, in our new economy. Robert Morris, one of the unsung primary movers of the American Revolution, there's a reason why he, he, his history has kind of overlooked his contributions. Uh, he is considered the financier of the American economy, the architect of the American economy. Um, you know, he was... Uh, uh, very much interested in global commerce at the mm -hmm. time and mm -hmm. was really at the genesis of this idea of the reign of trade. And so United States really brings that to the table, to the well, world which, stage. And when you look at some of the founding fathers, they weren't politicians by nature. They were business people. They Correct. were the business class. Yes. So, you, you know, oftentimes we try to, um, you know, raise up our founding fathers as these godlike figures, they were merchant class businessmen. Yes. They owned plantations, they owned slaves, they were in the business of making money. Yes. I think the only one who wasn't, um, if I remember correctly, Paul Revere, even though he was known as a brilliant silversmith, died penniless. Yes. <laughs> but he wasn't such a great businessman. But it would have been natural for them to gravitate towards other merchant class people, whether they were in England or the Netherlands or France or mm -hmm. Spain. And it makes sense that when Franklin is in London in the 75, 76 era. For, ten, for 10 years prior to the revolution, Franklin was the colonial he, agent in London. And he fell in love with France sure. and London. He fell in love with all that stuff. So it would have been natural that he would have been bringing that home. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But Prospect Hill itself, you know, we, we talk about our city of 10 hills here. Um, they're not really hills. They're drumlins. Drumlins from the glaciers. They just keep rolling down. But it would have been a spectacular vantage point for Washington to see right across the Charles River into Cambridge and into Boston. And in fact, um, at the heights of Prospect Hill was a 76-foot mast of a sailing ship, the HMS Diana, which ran aground during the Battle of Chelsea Creek. And the Continentals pieced apart the, the smoking wreck and got a 76-foot mast 
and put that at Prospect Hill. So when Washington raises this flag over the, over the Continental Army you on the new establishment, it. you can see it for the entire city. The British saw the flag in one of the coldest winters on record. Um, one of the British soldiers' diaries mentions the ink freezing in the pen as he's writing a letter. Um, they see this, what they call a Union flag raise, because they, they focused on the Union Jack part. They may, have, may or not have seen the stripes, you know, because what they saw is a Union Jack, right. and all of a sudden they thought, well, maybe we're one family after all. Maybe we're not going to, maybe this is a sign of submission. And in Washington's account of the Prospect Hill flag raising, he's jokingly writing Joseph Reed saying, the British think we have submitted because right. we've raised the Union flag. Ha, ha, ha. You know, and I'm wondering <laughs> if he was a wily old, you know, by incorporating that in, whatever the motives for putting that into the corner of that banner, I think it was a brilliant maneuver Absolutely. on his part. Because I would have, you know, if I'm Washington and I'm sitting up there saying, I got this ragtag army against the greatest naval fleet ever assembled in addition to the Armada, the Spanish Armada, I don't want to get croaked on my first winter sure. out. So I'm just going to kind of tell them, yeah, we're still friends, buddy, but we're going to fight you. And, to the and death. also maybe it was a, you know, you have to think about the political implications sure. of one third of the, of the country was loyalist, one third was sort of neutral, and one third were patriots. Mm -hmm. So maybe they were working on the neutrals. That to send a message, well, we're, we're communicating that we're part of, we're part of the British family, so to speak, but we're also independent. So maybe this was an attempt to lever and lobby folks that were on the fence to join the cause of independence. One more time, there's a website, I think, on the back. Is there not? Do you have, you have your own website, though? Um, yes, I do. I have, I have a Tell website. Folks that website that yeah, they can go it's, to. It's just byrondelier.org. Um, or byrondelier.com. Uh, the book can be searched on Amazon. Just put the first American flag and Byron Delir in there and it, it comes up. Yep. And like I said, we're, we're selling signed copies now. Um, and uh, very, it's been nine years in the works. Um, it's been a, a love affair for me to do this research. And um, I think what it brings to the table that's unique is I re we've really identified this, this one month time where you see a new Navy, a new army, a new flag, and a new name for a nation all came into being between December 3rd, 75, and January 2nd, 76. And this really lends itself to why Americans had to feel a sense of national unity to engage in this fight and to really risk their lives and put everything on the line to take up arms against a government power. That's a question that we have to think of as, as modern Americans. What would it take for you to take up arms against the government? Mm -hmm. That's a huge emotional issue. And I try to delve into some of the reasons why this happened and some of the great things that, that made our nation into what it is today. Byron, it looks like a beautiful read, very nice, and it's 186 uh, pages. Well, it's uh, 100 pages, but there's a lot of uh, Roman numerals in the front. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's going to be a great read. I think you should probably talk to our friends at the uh, Porter Square Book. Okay. Because this would fly off the shelves. Sure. We've had a couple of authors with Somerville Bent on here before, one being um, Mimi Graney, uh -huh. who founded uh, the Fluff Festival here. Okay. So, you know, we love having people who write about our city. So keep coming back. I know you've participated in the flag raising for five years now? Yes. Five years up there. You had beautiful weather this year as Absolutely. opposed to the year before when I don't think anybody wanted to be up on top of that hill. Right. They postponed it the year before. And I, I remember four or five years ago, after standing out in the elements for so long, my lips were frozen. I couldn't even, <laughs> I couldn't even say anything. Imagine poor Washington <laughs> oh, up there. You know? So my, my guest has been Byron DeLear, the author of The First American Flag, Revisiting the Grand Union at Prospect Hill. Buy it on Amazon. Take a look at um, Brian, uh, Byron's website and make sure you know your history of Somerville. Byron, thank you so much for thank joining you. me today. Thank you, Joe. Thank Thanks you very, very much. much. My guest again, Byron DeLear. As always, stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time. General George Washington, commander of the Continental Army, by authority granted by the Second Continental Congress on Monday, January 1st, 1776, 
we celebrate the formation of a new Continental Army! Yay! In response to the King's speech being distributed through our lines, I hereby direct that these Continental Colors hereforth called the Great Union Flag be raised on the most visible position in the American lines, Prospect Hill. We affirm our resolve to be free and independent from Great Britain and bear witness to the public raising of the first United Colony Colonies flag. In addition, I hereby direct that His Majesty's speech be publicly burned. <laughs> Detail. Detail. Fire detail forward. to attention and present arms for the new flag.